Hi, Dr. H here. This video will be our Unit 5 review and we'll go over uh, meiotic cell division and some genetics and heredity. So to start with meiosis, remember this is the cell division that is involved with sexual reproduction. Okay, any sexually reproducing organism right, that requires two parents is going to undergo some sort of meiotic cell division. And the reason that organisms need this meiotic cell division in addition to uh, the mitotic cell division is to maintain the chromosome number. When two parents donate DNA to the offspring, uh, both parents need to cut the amount of DNA in those cells by half so that the resulting offspring then have the correct chromosome number. So this is what my meiosis does. It takes the chromosome number, this diploid chromosome number, where the cells have two copies of every chromosome and cuts them down to the haploid number where the cells have only one copy of every chromosome. Also, very important to keep in mind here as we go over all of this uh, heredity information, the big major advantage to sexually reproducing is the high level of genetic diversity that it provides to the species. And this genetic diversity is very important in terms of evolution because it is what allows the population to adapt to a potentially changing environment. So looking at meiosis, uh, there are a lot of similarities between mitosis and meiosis. Uh, one big difference that we see right away, meiosis occurs in two stages. There are two separate cell division events that happen through one meiotic division. Before uh, the first round of meiosis occurs, there is an interphase, okay? And this interphase will be very similar to what happens before mitosis, in that there will be a G1, there will be S phase where the DNA will be replicated, and that re replicated DNA will then be checked over in G2, and then the cell will enter into the first round of meiosis, which we call meiosis 1. Okay, and this is where all of the unique events in meiotic cell division occur. Okay, this is the reduction division. The parent cell going into meiosis 1 will be a diploid cell, and at the end of this first round of meiosis, we will have two haploid daughter cells. The names of all of these stages in meiosis are copied over from mitosis. So you see here we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Uh, they are denoted with a one here because this is the first meiotic division. So prophase one, metaphase one, etc. The important unique events here um, in meiosis occur early in meiosis one during prophase one. And this is where the homologous chromosomes, so the, the two copies of the chromosome, one from each parent, are going to match up. They're going to pair with each other to form what is called a tetrad. And while they are in this tetrad formation, the two homologous chromosomes can exchange pieces of DNA. Okay, and this is called crossing over. So during crossing over, we will actually see a physical break of the DNA molecule. Right? Remember that each arm, each chromatid, here of the duplicated chromosomes is one linear piece of DNA. So during crossing over, 
these p linear pieces of DNA will break and they will attach to the homologous partner. So what we will end up with is a single piece of DNA with genetic material from both parents on it. Right? Some of the genes will be from the maternal parent, the other will be from the paternal parent. So this gives the offspring new combinations of traits which were not seen in the parental generation. So this is our first source of genetic diversity that is very, very important for sexually reproducing organisms. The other source of genetic diversity here comes from the way the chromosomes align themselves during metaphase one. Okay, they will align along the center of the cell, but randomly. So the maternal chromosomes and the paternal chromosomes will line up on either side of the center of the cell, and that will be completely random. And depending on how they arrange themselves, we will end up with unique daughter cells. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about the genetic diversity a little bit more uh, once we go through the meiotic divisions. So finishing up meiosis one, here we see at the end, uh, going through telophase one, we have haploid cells because each of these daughter cells will have one copy of each chromosome. Uh, but these are duplicated chromosomes. They are made up of two chromatids. So we still need another round of division to, to separate those sister chromatids. And that is what happens in meiosis two. Okay, meiosis two immediately follows meiosis one. This process here is very, very similar to mitosis, okay, where it's pretty much all the same events. Very important to remember though, the DNA here is already duplicated. So there is no DNA replication between meiosis one and meiosis two. For the most part, these cells will go right from meiosis one right into meiosis two. There may be a very, very short interphase in between, uh, but there is certainly no need for DNA replication. And the steps here of meiosis two, very, very similar to what we see in mitosis, where now the chromosomes line up singly along the center of the cell and the sister chromatids are pulled apart by the spindle fibers. And at the end of meiosis two, at the end of telophase, there are four genetically unique daughter cells. Okay, each of these four haploid cells at the end of meiosis are genetically unique from each other and from the parent cell. So where did this genetic diversity come from? There are two big sources of genetic diversity that occur during the meiotic cell division. Uh, the first one is the independent assortment. Okay? And this refers to the way the chromosomes line up along the equator during meiosis one. Okay, remember, the chromosomes match up with their homologous partner, and when they align themselves, the maternal and the paternal chromosome will go on either side of the midline. And depending on the way those chromosomes line up, we have lots of different variations. Okay, and there is a very quick formula to figure out how many ways a set of chromosomes could arrange themselves. And that is uh, find the haploid number, that is the number of pairs of chromosomes in a cell, that's given by N, and the number of genetically unique combinations due to independent assortment is two to the N power. So for humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, that gives us two to the 23rd power genetically unique combinations of chromosomes, that is over eight billion possible combinations of ways to arrange 
are 23 pairs of chromosomes during meiosis one. The other source of genetic diversity during meiosis is the crossing over events. These occur during meiosis one, and this is when the homologous partners actually exchange genetic information. Okay, the DNA strand will break and will reform on its homologous partner, giving us brand new combinations of genes not seen in the parental cells. And because this crossing over is basically random, it can occur anywhere along the chromosomes, that gives us a functionally infinite amount of genetic diversity just through meiosis. Okay, then when we factor in the random fertilization events that occur, if there are multiple eggs and multiple sperm involved, you can see how this very, very large amount of genetic diversity comes about very, very quickly in a sexually reproducing population. Last thing I wanna talk about with meiosis is what happens if meiosis does not proceed correctly. These errors in meiosis are termed non-disjunctions, okay? And these occur when chromosomes or chromatids do not separate as they should. So these non-disjunctions can occur either in meiosis one or in meiosis two. And what is going to happen at the end if there is a non-disjunction the gametes, the haploid cells that are produced, will not have the correct number of chromosomes. They will either be missing a chromosome and will be termed N minus one, or they will have an extra copy of a chromosome. And they, that would be referred to as N plus one. So these gametes that have the incorrect number of chromosomes if these are used in a fertilization, then the resulting offspring would be missing a certain chromosome or could have an extra copy of a chromosome. And these can lead to some genetic disorders. Okay, so that wraps up the first part of our unit with meiotic cell division. So now we'll move into the second part of our unit, which is on genetics. Okay, and we'll start here with our quick overview of uh, simple Mendelian genetics. Okay, so remember Gregor Mendel, he worked on the inheritance of traits in pea plants and he really set the basis for m almost all of our understanding of genetics and inheritance of traits. And some very important terms here uh, that we need to make sure we are using correctly, especially in regards to the different generations that Mendel set up. Remember that these, the P generation, F1, F2 generations, these are very specific terms, right? You cannot just go grab two organisms and mate them and say that, well, that is my P generation and I just made an F1, right? The P generation has to be pure bred. It has to be true breeding. That means from, from a modern standpoint, that means that they are going to be homozygous, meaning that they have both their alleles, both versions of their gene are the same. The F1 only comes from a cross of two P generation individuals. Okay? And F2s only come from crossing two F1s. So make sure that if you are using these terms that they are used correctly. So Mendel came up with a few very important conclusions that we still refer to today and we still base most of our understanding of inheritance on. Uh, first, he concluded that there were two copies of every gene in a cell, and we certainly understand that now that we understand the 
uh, diploid nature of most of our cells. One of these alleles comes from each parent, right? One from the mother and one from the father. He then went on to describe how these two alleles would relate to each other. Uh, that one would be dominant and the other would be recessive. Okay, so the dominant trait is whatever trait will show up when both alleles are present. So in our example here from Mendel's work, the purple flower color is dominant over the white flower color because when a true breeding purple flower is crossed with a true breeding white flower, the purple color shows up. Another very common trap that students fall into is to uh, mix up dominance and prevalence. It just because a trait is the dominant allele does not mean that it is the most common form in the population. Right? There are lots and lots of examples of recessive alleles that are much more common than their dominant counterpart. So from all of this work, Mendel came up with what we call his two laws of inheritance. Uh, the first one here is the law of segregation, which says that when the reproductive cells, the gametes are produced, only one copy of each gene is packaged into that cell. And from our modern understanding, we certainly, we certainly now can recognize that that is due to homologous chromosomes are separated during meiosis one to create these haploid cells. So we only get one copy of each gene. Mendel's other law is the law of independent assortment. And he saw this when he started to look at more than one trait at once, when he did his dye hybrid crosses. This law states that traits will be passed on independent of each other. So in the example that I'm showing here, the color of the P and the shape of the P do not travel together. They do not depend on each other. The color is inherited and the shape is inherited. One does not travel with the other. Okay, they move separately. So how should we go about solving any genetics problems that may arise on the AP test? A good first place to start would be maybe thinking about doing a Punnett square. Okay, Punnett squares might be useful if they are only asking about a single trait and it is a fairly straightforward inheritance pattern. But the important thing to remember here um, is that there really are only six types of monohybrid crosses that we could potentially see, okay? And they are shown here on the screen. So if you are presented with a single monohybrid cross, uh, my hope would be that you could just look at it and recognize that it is one of these six and you can identify what the offspring would look like without having to actually go and do the Punnett square. If you are presented with a cross with more than one trait, uh, then we certainly don't want to be doing a large Punnett square for two or three maybe traits at a time. So for those, uh, we want to use the rules of probability. Okay, and remember that since these traits are moving independently, and we are looking at the likelihood of two independent events happening together, uh, to find the total probability of them happening, then we need to multiply their individual probabilities. So in this case, we have a dihybrid cross, which we have broken out into its two separate monohybrid crosses, uh, one for color and one for shape of the P. And to, to combine these two traits together, we would just find the individual probabilities of each trait uh, 
and multiply them together to find the probability of, of those two traits occurring together. So for example, uh, if we wanted to know how many yellow wrinkled peas we would have, we just look and see that yellow is three fourths and wrinkled is one fourth and multiply those two fractions together and we get three sixteenths. So three sixteenths of our peas we would expect to be yellow and wrinkled. I believe that this could be the level of math that they would expect you to be able to perform without a calculator. Okay, multiplying fractions together is something that they w could reasonably expect you to do with paper and pencil. Okay, so make sure that you remember how to do that and how to use these probability rules. There is one specific cross that I do want to mention here uh, because it is used quite often to determine the genotype of an, of an individual and this is the test cross. In a test cross, we cross an individual with the dominant phenotype and we don't know the genotype, we cross that with a recessive individual. Remember that a recessive individual has to be homozygous recessive, meaning that they have two copies of the recessive allele. The reason we do this is to determine the genotype of that dominant individual. Is it homozygous dominant or is it heterozygous? Because physically, they will look the same. And depending on the results in the offspring, we can then determine the, the genotype of that dominant parent. Okay, this is very, very useful to figure out the genotype. Because many times we can't tell just by looking what the genotype is. So this test cross, again, an, an individual with unknown genotype with the dominant phenotype crossed with a homozygous recessive individual. If there is just genetics on the test, there is a good bet that it will be a little bit more involved than just straightforward Mendelian uh, dominant recessive relationships. It'll probably be something a little bit more complex, such as uh, incomplete dominance. This is where there we can't really say that one allele in this case one color of flower is truly dominant over the other because when both alleles are present in our heterozygous individuals we have a third phenotype showing up okay and oftentimes this is a mixture of our two homozygous phenotypes so we have white flowers and we have red flowers. Those are both our true breeding uh, homozygous lines. We cross them and we end up with a pink flower. Okay, that pink flower is heterozygous and it is a mixture of our two other colors, right? Red and white mixed together to make pink. Or we could see uh, something like codominance. This is where there are multiple alleles. Okay? In our example here of blood type, there are three different alleles that give rise to blood typing in humans. And two of the alleles are both fully dominant over, a, over the third. And when those two dominant alleles are present, both of them are fully expressed on the red blood cell. One other extension to Mendel's work is gene linkage. And this is where genes do not seem to follow uh, Mendel's law of independent assortment, where genes tend to travel together. It took a while for researchers to figure out what was happening with linkage, uh, and it led to the discovery of chromosomes 
as being the site of the genetic information, the site of the genes. And the first linkage studies were done in fruit flies. Right? Drosophila make a wonderful model organism for genetic studies. Uh, and the, one of the first linked traits that, we, that was studied was this white-eyed mutation. So in the lab of T.H. Morgan, back in the early 1900s, around 1920 or so, uh, these genetic crosses were being done. And what they noticed in the F1 generation, uh, was all the flies were red eyes, which told them that red was dominant over white. Then when the F2 generation was created, they did see the expected three to one ratio of red eyes to white eyes, but they noticed that none of the females had white eyes. It was only the males that were showing up with this mutation. So lots of crosses later, they determined that this white-eyed mutation is carried on the X chromosome. So this is now referred to as a sex-linked gene. Okay, any gene that is on the X chromosome is a sex-linked trait. These sex-linked traits show up more often in males than in females because males only have one copy of the X chromosome. Females, of course, will have two. So males then only need to inherit one recessive allele to show this white-eyed trait. Females would need to inherit two. So this is going to change the ratios a little bit um, in terms of male and female showing the trait. So if you are, if you are faced with a sex-linked cross, remember that you have to keep track of the chromosomes along with the gene and keep track of the X chromosomes and what kind of allele they are carrying. Okay, sex linkage is not the only type of linkage. We can also have traits that are on the same chromosome that are linked together and tend to travel together in the offspring. And this was, again, work in the T.H. Morgan lab in the early 1900s. Here we see data from one of his test crosses. So taking our F1 dihybrid and crossing that with a double recessive mutated fly. Uh, by straight Mendelian genetics, we would expect equal ratios of all four phenotypic classes, but because these two genes here are carried on the same chromosome, they tend to travel together and the parental type offspring occur in a much higher percentage than the recombinant offspring. The recombinant offspring with one trait from each parent being mixed together arise from the crossing over events that occur during the meiotic division in the female fruit fly. What we can then do with this recombination data is to calculate this uh, recombination frequency. Right? What percent of the offspring show these recombinant traits? And very simply, that's just taking the total number of recombinant offspring and dividing that by the total number of offspring overall. So in this case, we see that we have a recombination frequency of 17%. This calculation is very useful in order to roughly map the relative positions of genes on a chromosome. Okay, the higher the recombination frequency, the further apart two genes are located on a chromosome. Okay, so by doing th these crosses with genes in pairs, uh, 
we can come up with a gene linkage map. Okay, and here we see a short little section of a Drosophila chromosome map with a few different genes located on it with their respective recombination frequencies listed. Okay, finally to wrap up here, um, we have some uh, cases where inheritance is completely non-Mendelian and does not seem to follow any of the rules that Mendel set out. Um, because they behave, these genes do behave very, very differently. Um, first off, we have extra nuclear genes, and these are traits which would be carried on the DNA either in the chloroplast or in the mitochondria. And these traits are not inherited following any of Mendel's laws because they only come from one parent. Okay, the mother, the egg, supplies all of the organelles. The sperm cell only provides the haploid nucleus. None of the offspring's organelles come from the father. So these mitochondrial and chloroplast genes all come from one parent. So we see a very different inheritance pattern. We can also see some cases where expression of a gene is not due to the actual DNA sequence itself, but something structurally with the DNA. Uh, and this is what we call epigenetics. So something that is above and beyond the actual DNA sequence. Um, an example of this is genomic imprinting, where the DNA in one parent will be modified by addition of methyl groups and that methylated DNA is silenced and that methylation pattern is passed on it is inherited so the paternal form of a gene will always be expressed over the maternal version of a gene because of these inherited methylation patterns okay and this is Again, this is what we call epigenetics. Okay, and our last uh, non-Mendelian aspect here is influence of the environment. Okay, just because two, in two individuals have the same genetics does not mean they will have the same physical appearance. Okay, the environment can influence what genes are expressed, how much of that gene is expressed, or even the actual shape of the protein. Okay, here we see the effects of soil pH on flowers. Okay, these two flowers have identical genetics, but the pH of the soil is very different, so that changes the color of the flowers by changing the protein structure of the pigment molecules. Okay, so that is our Unit 5 review. Uh, we went over meiotic cell division and the sources of genetic diversity, and then we got into inheritance and genetics. So I hope that all made sense. Science like Galileo dropped the orange.